Hello and welcome to If You Love This Planet. My special guest this week is Dale Bridenbar, a former nuclear engineer and retired energy consultant to government and other groups interested in evaluation of nuclear power plant safety and licensing. Dale was employed for around 20 years with General Electric, where he undertook many different roles, including being responsible for the establishment and management of systems to monitor and measure boiling water reactor equipment and system operational performance. In his role as a consultant within his own company and others, Dale worked with many organisations in the US and overseas, including the Swedish Energy Commission, the Union of Concerned Scientists and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Dale Breidenbach, welcome to If You Love This Planet. Thank you. Now, Dale, um, I'll never forget when I first met you um, and your two other contemporaries, partners in crime, Greg Miner and Dick Hubbard. And it was in California uh, in a house surrounded by flowers in the garden and everything. And there there seemed to be a sort of general hush-hush in this conversation. I've got a bit of background... <laughs> Um, and uh, you were all sitting there really nervous, and it turned out that the three of you had decided to resign from General Electric um, for certain reasons as nuclear engineers, and it was an, a fairly profound day for me, and in fact, I think for you too. Why don't you um, tell the audience, Dale Breidenbar, why, why you and, and Greg Miner and Dick Hubbard decided at that point in time, I think it was 1976, to resign from General Electric. Well, you're correct, Helen. It was in 1976, and uh, the date of our three uh, uh, resignations was February 2nd, 1976. We had, of course, decided to do that uh, sometime before that, uh, and it was a result of being concerned about the way we felt the nuclear program was being managed within the United States and around the world. Uh, at the time, there was a big campaign underway in the state of California uh, to try and pass a nuclear safeguards initiative, which would have required that certain safety studies be performed before any more nuclear plants could be built within the state. That was Prop 15, wasn't it? Prop that was yes. Prop 15, yes. And at the time, of course, uh, my job was basically to take care of all the problems that were coming up with the nuclear plants that GE had built and that were in operation around the world. Uh, and even more so, or even more Specific to that, I had been assigned about a year prior to February to head up a special reevaluation of the safety of the Mark I containments that most of GE's nuclear plants at that time were being supplied with. Uh, it happens to be the same containment system that is uh, present at the Fukushima plant in in Japan that we are all very familiar with right now. In 1976, uh, well, that safety reevaluation reevaluation program began in the spring of 1975, and I was assigned as the project manager to perform or to follow or organize the work that was that GE was doing in support of the 16 domestic utilities that had GE Mark I plants. As time went on, I became very concerned about the fact that we weren't certain that those plants would be able to survive the accident that they were supposedly designed to contain. What, like and, what, what sort of accident, Dale? Well, the accident, the, the accident that nuclear plants are supposed to be able to survive are the, a major rupture of the largest pipe within the reactor primary system and to contain any radioactive material that might be released without any leakage 
subsequent to that event. Well, now, and just explain to us, what's a major pipe within the... Are you talking about a huge pipe that transports water into the primary cooling system in the in the containment vessel? Is that the sort of thing you talk, And that would lead to a meltdown? Is that what you're talking about, Dale? Well, it could be one of those, yes. There, there are many, many pipes within yeah. the reactor system, of course. Yeah. And there are... Uh, the, the primary system is the reactor pressure vessel, which houses the reactor fuel, the, re, the, 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 the fuel that generates the heat. And then there are cooling pipes that come, in, that come in, there are steam pipes that go out, and there are emergency cooling systems that are attached to the reactor pressure vessel itself. What the, what the licensing requirements State is that the uh, the system should be designed to be able to withstand a break in the largest pipe that is attached to the reactor pressure vessel. Uh, which and would which would lead to what? I mean, what would, what ramifications would that have? Well, what that would have is what ramifications that would have is that the the system would be isolated. Hopefully, all the valves would close, but the cooling water for the reactor fuel and the steam that is being generated by that hot uh, nuclear fuel would escape from the reactor pressure vessel, and it would be necessary, or the, theoretically, what would happen is that the, that the containment system that surrounds the reactor pressure vessel and the piping would be able to contain all of that energy, steam, and radioactive material and not let anything get out. The problem that arose in 1975 is it became knowledge that the systems that uh, had been designed for the Mark I's and the Mark II's uh, plants had not taken into account what is called hydrodynamic loads. Which is, which, is a, uh, which is a term for uh, forces that could be exerted upon the containment system that could cause it to rupture and release radioactive material. Like, vibra- like vibration and stuff like that? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Like vibration, vibratory forces resulting from the rapid discharge of steam into, into pools of water. Yeah, so anyway, that uh, that is what I was doing in 1975 and 76. And did you have confidence that that in fact these Mark One containment vessels would would be able to withstand such a situation, Dale? No, we did not have confidence. Why? Because they hadn't been designed to withstand. Oh my that. God! <laughs> well, why weren't they desi- designed to withstand that? If that was a sort of the, the general standard and criteria for you know having a major accident. What, what? Well, it was it, it was a design error or a shortcoming or something that was overlooked. Did what, someone forget? Well, yeah, it's even. I guess it's even more uh, more important than somebody forgot. What uh, what they did do is they said that they looked at how much energy is contained within the primary reactor system. Of 100 tons of fuel. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, and, and all the water. Yeah. And uh, water at, at roughly 600 degrees Fahrenheit and 1,000 mm. pounds per square inch. Yeah. And what they did is they designed the containment to be able to contain the energy that would be released that's contained in that liquid. Mm-hmm. But they didn't take into effect into account the dynamic effects, the the, the pressure vibrations that would result when in a, when that energy was being released. Well, so I suppose you made a fuss about that and made reports and stuff. Did they fix it? Well, what happened is the, it came to light because General Electric was performing uh, tests at a test facility in San Jose on the next containment version, which was called the Mark III. Mm. And in the 
in the process of performing those tests, they had pretty good instrumentation on the on the test facility, and they noticed, or they you know they became aware very rapidly of these dynamic loads, these vibratory forces. Yeah. And uh, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was uh, being of advised of the ongoing tests, and in 1975, finally, the NRC sent letters to all of the the 16 U.S. utilities in the United States, and said, "How about it? You know, how about these uh, these vibratory forces that we've seen at the Mark III test facility? Were those taken into account and designed for in?" The Mark I oh, plant that's you're operating. That's in- and so what happened? And uh, the utilities came to GE and said, "Well, tell us that they were, so that we can get the NRC off our back." Mm-hmm. And GE said, "Well, in fact, they weren't." Oh my God! Oh my God! So and, then what happened? Well, then what happened is we got all of the utilities together. We, GE, and uh, we organized in the spring of 1975 uh, a, a rather loose organization called the Boiling Water, the Mark I Boiling Water Reactor Owners Group. Mm-hmm. And uh, GE set out to manage the reevaluation of all of the Mark I plants. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hired a lot of consultants put a lot of engineers to work, built some test facilities, and tried to identify the magnitude of the load that had been overlooked and uh, to figure out whether or not fixes could be uh, put in place to make the uh, Mark I plants meet the licensing criteria. Right. I'm interviewing... Dale Breidenbar, formerly a nuclear engineer with General Electric, and he's now talking about these Mark I uh, GE reactors um, of which Fukushima is composed, six of them, I think, and there are, what, 16 in still operating in the United States, right, Dale? Well, actually, there are 23. Oh, 23. Anyway, so what happens? So they put up in, in, in this big sort of commission, investigative commission, to try and work out what to do. That was late 75. And That's correct. what happened? Well, uh, GE and the utilities and the consultants worked, I'll say, day and night, not 24-7, but were pretty much close to that, mm-hmm. and uh, tried to figure out how bad the problem really was. Mm. And, of course, some 16 or 17 of these plants were already in operation. There were another another eight or so in the United States and another 10 around the world that hadn't been uh, put into service yet. And, and it was... Uh, there was a... A, you know, a lot of pressure to try and decide what to do. Yeah, I it, bet there was, was. It was obvious that they no longer met the licensing criteria. Yeah. They were not technically safe to operate, mm-hmm. uh, and there was uh, there was pressure to keep them running, and there, of course, was pressure to shut them down. Right. But there was more pressure to keep them running because... I went to my boss one night in January of 1976, and I said, we got some real problems here. Some of these plants, uh, the numbers that we're getting uh, could have a, a complete rupture of the primary system, loss of emergency cooling water, uh, if the numbers that we are generating right now are correct. Yeah. Uh, we we need to we need to convince or we need to tell the NRC that if we find in the very near future that these numbers are correct, we got to shut these plants down. And uh, my boss said to me, "Well, it can't be that bad, Dale. And besides, if we had to shut these plants down at this point in time, 
it could be the end of GE's nuclear business. Oh, my God, that makes my blood turn cold. So, what then happened? So, uh, well, the, the approach that was used was uh, GE convinced the NRC that the probability of a major rupture of the primary system was very low, and uh, therefore the plants could continue to operate. Well, the uh, eval- reevaluation was performed, and then eventually uh, the fixes would be applied, uh, and, and uh, the NRC bought that. So did they ever put any, in any fixes over time? Yes, they did, yes. I, I quit in February of 76. Why? Because I didn't think that was the right way to approach it. I thought, I, you know, I didn't, mm. we didn't know they were safe and they shouldn't have been running. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the thing that happened, of course, was I quit and the program went on. Uh, 76, in 1980 or thereabouts, some two years later, they uh, got the NRC's approval with the load definitions that were de- were finally developed. What that means is they knew how strong the forces could be that they had to design to meet. Yes. And uh, then some five or six years later, uh, all of the Mark I plants eventually got fixes applied to them. How did they fix them? Did they make the steel thicker or the concrete thicker, or did they reinforce the containment well, vessel? Well, basically, basically, basically what they did is they uh, – uh, it was different for for different plants because they weren't all exactly identical. They were all mm. identical concepts, but mm. they were had been designed by different people. Uh, they reinforced the steel structures. They uh, tie uh, put in anchor bolts and tied every tried to tie everything down. They put in uh, jet uh, force deflectors inside of the containment. They put in like uh, mufflers to reduce the uh, vibratory forces that could could uh, be experienced. There were some seven, 15 or 20 different fixes that had to be implemented, all of, all of which, of course, had to be implemented during a shutdown, during an outage. They couldn't do it during the plant was in operation. Mm. And were you satisfied those fixes were adequate, Dale? Well, I don't know, because I wasn't there anymore. Oh. Uh, but you must I, have analyzed them in, in your then-current situation as a, as a consultant. Uh, well, I thought they were pretty safe. Now, was I happy with it? No. Uh, was I happy with the containment system itself, the Mark I containment system itself? No, because the development of the Mark I came out of the competitive pressures to make a plant that was less expensive to build. Uh, uh. And the pressure suppression system, which is used in all of the GE boiling water reactors, uh, was a way in which the size of the containment vessel could be kept to a minimum. In the Mark I, it, it, they are absolutely kept to a minimum. And what results is you have a very tight containment with very little room for error in case they, they made a mistake in the, in the safety evalu- analysis. It also makes them difficult to uh, maintain, to perform maintenance on. They're, they're just, they're really tight. It's hard to get people in there, and the radiation levels are high. They're and very so small. Yep. yep. Well, it's, yeah. Well, I'm in, I'm interviewing Dale Breidenbar, formerly uh, employed by General Electric, on these Mark One uh, GE designed reactors now. 
Uh, when did they build the Mark I GE reactors at F Fukushima? Well, I, I don't know exactly what, what year construction was started. Unit 1 was built by... Uh, Unit 1 was a, was a general electric project, and it went into service commercial service, I believe, in 1971. Uh, typically, in Japan, they were taking four to five years to build a nuclear plant at that time. Mm. So, it, you know, they started in 1965, 66, something like that. Uh, I visited the Fukushima plant in either 1970 or 71. Mm. I, was, I was not there for a long period of time. But in the job that I was doing as manager of product service at the time, uh, it was my job to be the uh, the to manage the organization, the engineers that would deal with the TEPCO after the plant went into service and if they had any problems. Yeah. By technical support to them. I was, uh, and so were there problems, and how did you feel about it? Well, uh, in 1971, they had just gone into service. Uh, I was, uh, I don't recall of any particular problems that they had that were different from the problems that any complicated thing like a nuclear plant has during mm. during startup. Mm. Uh, and then shortly after 1971, uh, General Electric reorganized things, and uh, I no longer had responsibility for international plants. In about 1972 or 73, uh, I switched over and managed the service operation for all of the domestic nuclear plants in the United States. So I didn't have direct contact with the, the Fukushima yeah, plant. But they, they continued to build five more, right? That's correct. Now, so, okay, Dale, give us your assessment of, in fact, post-accident reactor design, how they've stood up. I know that it seems likely that Unit 1 suffered a problem and started melting down even before the tsunami and before they lost the diesel backup generators and their emergency cooling system, um, that, in fact, the earthquake damaged the reactor. Is that your contention, and what about the other reactors there? Okay. I don't know if that is, in fact, the case or not. I, it, it certainly is the case that uh, TEPCO, the Japanese utility, has released information just this week, uh, earlier this week, uh, that indicates that they had either full or very nearly full core melt on all three of the reactors that were in operation when the earthquake hit. Uh, the Unit number one, which is the Fukushima one, the uh, the the plant that GE built uh, independently, uh, appears to have had core melt within a few hours mm. of uh, the earthquake. Uh, I don't know. You know, the core melt would not happen immediately, and it, perhaps. They, there might have been some damage. There might have been damage to the primary system mm. from the earthquake. I, unit one is a little bit different than the other than the other four or five. Mm. Unit one has a thing called an emergency condenser, which is a large component at the upper levels of the reactor building, and it's quite possible that that piece of equipment might have been. Uh, taken out of uh, out of service or been ruptured as a result of the earthquake, but I I haven't seen anything that's been reported that confirms that. And of course, the plant is so radioactive; it's very difficult for them to get in and try yeah. to figure out what really did happen. Dale, do you think that they've only just realized that the three of them melted down within the first couple of days, or and or do you think that they knew right from the start and they've been sitting on that on this information? 
I don't think they knew. Oh. I think I think uh, I think uh, you know the instrumentation that lead enabled them to make that judgment was wiped out mm. by by the uh, by the earthquake and by the core melt and 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 by the tsunami and the loss of electrical power and, and all of that. Yeah. And uh, they of course knew that they were in serious trouble. They knew they knew within a few days that they had uh, fuel damage because they had uh, hydrogen explosions. Mm. And you can't generate hydrogen without fuel damage there. So uh, they knew they were that things were not good, and they they probably knew, or I'm sure they knew early on, that they had severe core damage. But uh, whether they knew that it was as extensive as they now are reporting, uh, I would say probably not. So they're probably now putting uh, one, to one, one and one together through the retrospectoscope and working out with their new measurements and data and the robots going in and measuring pressures and temperatures and measuring radiation levels, they're putting together retrospectively what happened. I think that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Now, and the other thing that worries me enormously, Dale, as, as a physician myself and a paediatrician is I don't think they've got any idea of how much radiation escaped initially, has been escaping all the way along because their instruments were not working. Um, they are sort of doing transitory gamma measurements, which really doesn't... I mean, they've got no idea of the total quantity, have they? They're, they're guessing. Like right. 770,000 tetrabecquerels or some god-unknown figure. You know, where would they get that from? Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I'm not a health physicist kind of a person. Yeah. I'm not a, not a radiochemist, but yeah. uh, it, uh, it, they are certainly... Uh, Lacking instrumentation to be able to tell them exactly what went on. Yeah. I just I just saw today on uh, on the internet a interview with uh, Army uh, Arnie Gunderson. I I know you I know you know him, but yes. anyway, he he was talking with uh, John King of CNN about uh, hot particles and and. and yeah. Expressing a lot of concern about particles that are released that are too small to really measure with the normal radiation monitoring equipment, but that <clears throat> which float around and can get into the human body and cause serious damage eventually. Yeah, there was a wonderful doctor called Dr. John Goffman who actually was employed by the Atomic Energy Commission way back and then helped with Glenn Seaborg discover um, plutonium. And he was employed by another f with another fellow called Arthur Tamplin to investigate the dangers of radiation uh, related to nuclear power. Um, and he they came up with such a damning report <laughs> that the AEC fired them. You know, if the if the Atomic Energy Commission or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the utilities don't like necessarily what people come up with when they're asked to produce a report, they fire them or they get them to see a psychiatrist. Which leads me on to my next question, Dale. I was privileged to be present with you three GE engineers when you made the momentous decision to resign because you didn't feel that nuclear power could ever be made safe. And I know that your wives, too, played a role in convincing you about that. Would you like to talk a little bit about what you went through, Dale, um, as, as professional men, um, uh, how you were shunned um, in the community of Santa Cruz where G is, is located, how tough it was on your families, and how it took you a long time to work out how to be able to survive financially uh, now that you are not working at GE. Would you like to just give us a sort of paint us a scenario of, 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 of what you went through? Well, as, as I indicated a little bit earlier, Helen, it was, it was certainly a, a gut-wrenching experience for me and uh, I was, of course, concerned about you know, how would I make a living, uh, how would I provide for my family, what would I do. 
how would the many friends that I had within the industry feel about uh, me resigning and publicly saying, uh, telling about what I knew. Uh, and it would not at all have been possible without the support of my wife, who was very understanding and supportive. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, it's, it's just a, a difficult decision, uh, it, but it was one that I felt I had to make. It so. was a very noble decision. Would you like to put Shah on now, Dale? Uh, Dale's wife is Shah Breidenbar, a, a close friend of mine also. Hello. Shah. I, I, yes. Yeah, welcome to the program, Shah. Um, I've just said to the audience that um, it would be really interesting from a personal perspective if you would describe um, what Dale went through, what you went through, what the family went through after his really noble decision to resign from General Electric on principles of safety and public health um, and how you were shunned in the community, what happened to you uh, as you still continue to live in Santa Cruz and how difficult it was to, you know, move on to something else so that, that Dale could support the family. Would you like to just give a brief sort of picture and scenario of what you went through, Shah? Sure. Um, we were living in San Jose at the time, mm. uh, Helen, not, mm-hmm. not Santa Cruz. That's right, we, sorry. We live in Santa Cruz yeah. now. Um, well, it was heartbreaking to watch Dale agonize over that decision. It, he had had so many friends, and he was so well-respected in his career, and initially he had been very proud of being uh, part of something that they thought was really going to be a a good thing for mankind, and um, then to begin to learn a lot of aspects of it that uh, came to light as as time went on, you know, such as what to do with the waste, and um, the, the ramifications, the connection to possible uh, weapons, and of course, at that time, we didn't even conceive of the type of terrorism that we see going on in the world today. But so there were these kinds of um, uh, considerations that went beyond the, the uh, engineer's technology concerns um, that um, I think it became impossible to, to continue to stay a part of that without these things being addressed, but it was just, it was heartbreaking for me to see him struggle with that. And then, uh, of course I, I would be supportive. And I, from the, from what I knew, from what I learned as a non-engineer, uh, there were too many social considerations. I thought, I don't think this is, this is a good thing. (laughs) And, um, uh, then, um, as far as the family, um, of course, that uh, San Jose at that time was the the headquarters of General Electric's Atomic Energy Division, and so there were a lot. And we lived close to work, and uh, so when he did quit, um, people were shocked, and some people uh, applauded us for or him for his courage, uh, and said they would be supportive, but but many uh, in the industry just would never speak to him again. Yes. Which would continue to this day, people who had been close friends. Yes. And, um, yeah. Does, does that answer your question? Well, as far as the kids come, we had three teen, uh, three, well, let's see. Uh, uh, from 11 to 16 yeah. were the yeah. ages of our children. And teenagers, you know, don't want to be singled out for anything. No, no, <laughs> so no. So it, um, it was hard on them, I would say. Um, and uh, while, they were, while they understood and they were very proud of their dad, at the same time, uh, schoolyard jeers and comments, you know, they would just as soon not have had to no. endure. 
I'm interviewing uh, Shah Breidenbar, who is Dale Breidenbar's wonderful wife. Now, Shah, it's now a long time, 1975 to 2011. It's um, 36 years since amazing. he resigned. Um, amazing. Um, through the retrospectoscope then, Shah Breidenbar, how do you feel about what Dale did and, and the course he then took in life? How how do you feel about that? Oh, I I feel very proud, and I feel very proud of any tiny piece I might have had in in uh, in playing a part in this. And um, I I cannot conceive I cannot conceive of life had had he not done that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and once once you know that you are a part of something that has the potential for being very destructive, and not just to a small area, but a worldwide, as as we now see manifested uh, in Japan, um, it, it it becomes impossible. To it became it would be impossible for me to conceive of any other mm. path and um our of course we had many financial concerns and uh and even safety concerns but those those did not bear fruit no and and we've we've been uh i would say uh life has has been been personally blessed by that decision and the experiences that Dale especially has had, but I've shared some of those with him and people we've met who I, I think are just uh, people who are, I want to say, right-minded. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's a, a Buddhist concept of right livelihood and um, all of that. And... Um, that's how I feel. I, 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 I can't conceive of what the path would have been otherwise. Yes. It's so sad, though, Shah, isn't it, that there are so many men and some women in positions as such as the one Dale was in so many years ago in General Electric who know deep in their hearts and souls that what they're doing is really not right, uh, and I'm putting that mildly, but who, yeah, who do not have the courage uh, and foresight, I think, to step outside the boundaries of accepted societal behaviour and who they are and the money they're earning to do the right thing. And there, there are a few noble souls who lead the way. And, of course, Dale was one of them. So for that, I salute both of you, actually, knowing both of you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... Um... Nice to hear your voice after yeah. so many years. Yeah. Could you put Dale back now, please? Absolutely. And thank you very much. Hello. Hello, Dale. That I'm was, back. That was great. Now, I've got some more questions for you. I read this morning about the PLC program. It's a program logic controller, PLC, and it is put in many nuclear reactors now. In other words, they're computerizing many of the reactors, and when you designed reactors, there were no computers involved, right, Dale? Well, there were, yes, there were computers. Oh, there, they were? There were computers, oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, not not like they are used today. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what, what people are talking about now is this Stuxnet virus, which people think was designed by the Israelis to screw up the Iranian enrichment uh, facilities, um, their centrifuges. In, and, in Iran. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. And, and, and the article that I read today went on to say that, in fact, like the Stuxnet virus that was so uh, successful, it's, it's spelled S-T-U-X-N-E-T, um, so that there are other very smart, intelligent, uh, uh, often young men who uh, can design such viruses to get into uh, to components such as nuclear power plants. W would you like to comment about that, Dale? Is that possible? Well, I can comment on it. I'm, I'm sure that 
that's possible, and uh, I know I'm actually know more about it than you do because I only know what I read in the papers too. Yeah, I'm I'm not a computer uh, uh, engineer, and uh, and but of course the the concept that you're talking about is something that I'm sure. Or I know the U.S. Defense Department, Defense Department is, is is very much concerned about. Uh, you know, we're talking about cyber wars, and 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 that's uh, something that I'm sure there are some terrorists who would be trying to figure out how to do that to, to cause some severe disruption, damage, whatever. And well, it may not be terrorists. I mean, it can be young geeks who. Love experimenting and playing around with this stuff. It doesn't necessarily have to be terrorist, Dale. Well, no, that that's true. Yeah. Although, I uh, what I've recently read about it is that uh, I well, I, I think it 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 is more extensive, or that that there are. Uh, I don't think it's just the ordinary hackers that are doing it. I think it is done with an intent to cause harm. So. Well, yeah, but you can't necessarily prove that. And I think no. in this day and age of computers and incredible high-tech IT, uh, anything's possible. Now, there's, uh, there's another point I wanted to move on. I, I read today that there are 105,000 tonnes of highly contaminated water in Unit 1. At Fukushima. Okay, I don't, uh, I don't know yeah. the number, but I know they've got a lot of it. Yes. And and uh, Arnie Gunderson, the other nuclear engineer who I've interviewed for this program and who you know, um, yeah. he says that the structure of the of the whole nuclear reactor buildings and containment vessel has been severely weakened by all this water they've been pouring in, tons and thousands of tons of water. Would you like to comment on that, Dale Breidenbar? Well, I think that's certainly a, a good possibility. Uh, the the reactor building, that, that water is, is, of course, in a lot of different places in the Daiichi plant, and I'm sure there is a... Uh, a whole lot of it in the bottom of the reactor building. We know that there's a lot of it in the basement of the turbine building, which is a different structure. And the fact that, that water is there is, of course, one of the one of the reasons that the plant got in such severe trouble in the first place, because all of the electrical switch gear that controls the emergency cooling and the and the normal cooling. Uh, is pretty much located in the basement of the turbine building. And so that seawater, which uh, was brought in there by the tsunami, wiped out the normal electrical systems. But, of course, uh, the the plant operator, TEPCO, uh, in order to try and prevent fuel melt, core melt, uh, of the reactor, they've been pumping tons and tons and tons of seawater into the reactor or into the reactor building and, and some into the reactor core, some in spent fuel pools, and that water is radioactively contaminated. And I'm sure there is a lot of it building up in the basement of the reactor building, the turbine building, and, of course, a lot of it has already leaked out to sea. Yeah, it's very, it's so serious. Okay, Dale, let's move on to some sort of higher philosophical plane. Just from your experience um, in the nuclear industry, working both within the industry and without for so, so long, what is your prognosis now for the whole nuclear power industry post-Fukushima? Well, I'm sure that uh, my, what what's happening, of course, is there is a lot of pressure in the United States for the NRC to take a careful look at all of the Mark I plants uh, and to see if there, uh, what lessons should be learned from the Fukushima accident. 
and what that means for the U.S. plants. There are, of course, another 10 or 15 Mark I plants uh, in other parts of the world. There's uh, the six, uh, another 10 or so, six or eight, I don't know the exact numbers, somewhere between six and 10 in Japan. There are four or five in Germany. There's a couple in Switzerland. There's one or two in Spain. Uh, all of those plants are going to be looked at closely, I hope, and uh, see if what happened at Fukushima is possible to happen at the other plants, and hopefully it will take them less than six to ten years to figure out what to do. The The thing that's kind of interesting in the United States is that most of the Mark I plants are up for license extension review because most of them are now reaching the end of their normal license life. And I was uh, listening uh, briefly this morning to a proceeding going on in Washington, D.C. before the NRC. I wish they were talking about license extensions and what should be done. And the Vermont Yankee plant was given a extension of its operating license approximately a week after the Fukushima accident occurred. By the NRC. By the NRC, yeah. right. Without any without any, without any consideration of what the Fukushima accident might mean to the ongoing operation of Vermont Yankee. And in fact I think they uh, approved uh, an increase in the license in the uh, in the operating limit too. The, the power output. So I don't know what's going to happen. I, I can see the handwriting on the wall. What the industry of position is going to be is that what happened at Fukushima is a result of an earthquake that was far beyond what the plant was supposed to be designed to withstand, a, uh, a tsunami that was much higher than what the plant was supposed to be designed to withstand, and therefore, that can't happen at any of the Mark I plants in the United States or Europe or Spain or any place else. What Japan is going to do is, is uh, maybe a little bit more questionable because all of the Mark I plants in Japan are, of course, in a very active seismic area. They're all basically ocean-cooled, and so they've got... Uh, they can't hide behind that particular uh, excuse. But uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of pressure to keep those plants in operation because they need the electrical power. We're afraid of, we're uh, terrified of what global warming might result. <coughs> I don't know if you've been reading the weather reports in the United States. I have. Yep. Hotter than hell all over the United States, and so uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure to keep the nuclear plants running. Well, I personally, I think that no one bloody well should be using air conditioners in the United States. Maybe Houston, where it's so awful and hot and humid, but, you know, well, no, people have forgotten what sweat <laughs> glands are for, and sweat glands are so that when you sweat and the, the sweat uh, evaporates, it takes heat with it, and it's called the latent period of vaporization. It cools you down. You know, before we had electricity, there were no air conditioners. And no. I can't help, when I go to America, I absolutely boil in the summer. I mean, everyone wears T-shirts inside when it's snowing and freezing outside instead of putting on layered clothing and jumpers and sweaters. And in the, in the summer, you go into a theater or any public building, it's so cold it's like being in a refrigerator. I think the whole thing's nuts. Well, I agree with you. And uh, I also... I grew, I grew up in South Dakota where it was very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. And yeah. we had we had stoves, but we didn't have any air conditioning. There you go. See, and we've become spoilt, soft like jellos, wanting to maintain ourselves at the same temperature the whole year. I mean, that's not our entitlement now when you look at what's happening to the weather. And the other thing I would like to say, Dale... Bridenbar is that I predict through my crystal ball 
that Fukushima will, will signal the end over time of the nuclear power industry. And what I'm hoping is that it will have ongoing ramifications to impinge upon the wicked nuclear weapons industry, which is giving, you know, Obama's going to give it a shot of $85 billion extra dollars in the arm to build three new huge facilities to make new nuclear weapons. So the whole thing, from my perspective, is totally insane and becomes more psychotic by the minute. Well, I agree with you, Helen. I fully agree. I had, Let me put in one little pitch, which I, I assume you are aware of. But, uh, you know, the De U.S. Department of Energy uh, has undertaken a program uh, to try and get the U.S. power reactor industry to use some of the recycled plutonium mm. from, from, uh, from out-of-date out of uh, nuclear weapons uh, to burn up some of the plutonium in, in power plants. And I think that is the most ridiculous uh, thing that I have heard. Well, right. they had some of it in, in Unit 3 at Fukushima. Yes, they did. Not, not, from, uh, not from weapons, but, no. they, but they had plutonium there. Yeah. yeah ox, uh, fuel. Yeah, yeah things are, are, are so, I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know, I've always said it's going to take a major meltdown, Dale, to... Oh, well, we've had three of them. We've <laughs> had three of them now, let alone the cooling pools. You mean you know, four cooling pools going as well. So, and and uh, and I think, well, from my reading, Dale, there's been such a cover-up in Japan, both from the government, from TEPCO, and then the International Atomic Energy Agency had the gall to step in the other day and say that TEPCO's behaved in a, what was the word? Um, uh, I can't think of the adjective, but in an extraordinarily responsible fashion. Uh, so even they are lying. I mean, it's really, Dale, the lies that get to me from the nuclear industry more than anything. You know, if we lied in medicine, we'd be deregistered. We'd be killing our patients. Um, uh, you know, there's no way you would have lied in your work, yet the industry per se lies. Well, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> I know you wouldn't rave on like this the way I'm raving on, but at least you know me well enough to know that I do rave on and also that, you know, unfortunately I'm often right, which is also a pain in the neck. Anyway, we're all getting older. You know, I'm now 73 nearly and I got involved in this actually uh, when I was flown out by you people to California when you were making your decision to leave GE to work on Proposition 15, which was to essentially close down the reactors in California. Uh, well, uh, yes, and, uh, and of course, Prop, Prop 15 sort of sort of succeeded in California. I mean, it, it was defeated at the election, but the uh, the legislature passed law, laws just before the election that basically enacted almost everything that Prop 15. Yeah. Required. <laughs> that was great. There hasn't been a new nuclear plant in in California no. since then. No, and I think I think they're well on the way to closing now Diablo Canyon and San Onofre, which are both built on or very close to earthquake faults themselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I I think that that's a very likely uh, uh, result of mm. the Fukushima Fukushima mm. accident. Let's hope so. Well, we've run out of time, Dale and Shah. It's been an absolute pleasure to interview you um, on this program, and I hope everyone listening uh, takes a leaf out of Dale's book and does the right thing um, for the human race and for their own moral conscience. If that happened, you know, we'd probably be able to save the planet. <laughs> anyway, Dale, thank you very, very much. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for... Uh having me on, Helen. Okay, that's... I look forward to seeing you again one of these days. Yeah, I'm going to come and stay with you. You have a hot tub, right? I do. Oh, yeah, well, I imagine Unfortunately, myself... Unfortunately, it's cooled by Diablo, or heated by Diablo. Oh, <laughs> Dale, you don't say. Why not solar? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, anyway, I'm going to sit in your hot tub and drink red wine with you. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. That's a deal. <laughs> okay. Thanks, love. Bye-bye. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Dale Breidenbar, a former nuclear engineer and retired energy consultant in the area of nuclear plant safety and licensing. Thanks for listening again. You know, I think as you listen to this program more and more, you'll become better and better educated uh, about nuclear engineering and nuclear physics and uh, health physics and all sorts of things about which it is imperative for you to understand in this nuclear day and age. Okay, we'll see you next time. No, we'll talk with you next time. Bye for now.